Welcome to Copenhagen City Hall. We will start the first press conference of the C40 World Mayors Summit, um, giving the word, of course, to the host of the summit, Lord Mayor Jensen from Copenhagen. Thank you so much, dear colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the city of Copenhagen and C40, it is a very great pleasure that we today announce a new global commitment for C40, namely a global green new deal. With the global green new deal, we recognize that the world is in a state of climate emergency. The science is clear. Allowing global temperatures to increase more than 1.5 CO Celsius above pre-industrial levels risk an environmental crisis on a global scale. As mayors, our primary responsibility is to protect the lives and livelihoods for our citizens. Climate change now represents the greatest threat to the security, public health, and prosperity. From rising sea levels that threaten coastal communities to once in a hundred years heat waves or storms that now strike every five years. Cities around the world are on the front line of the global climate emergency. Many young people are anxious to the climate crisis, worried for their future on a planet marked by climate change. That is not fair. And as leaders, we have an obligation to listen and to act. Luckily, there is still time to act, but there is no moment to wait. There is no more room for empty promises, no more delay, and no more running from responsibility. We need immediate, decisive, and collective actions. And I'm very happy that Copenhagen is hosting this C40 World Mayor Summit, and I'm very happy to see you all here, my colleagues here and my colleagues here. Cities are central to achieve the Paris Agreement goals, accounting for more than 80% of energy consumption and 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. C40 has helped more than 100 cities to commit to carbon neutrality by 2050. Around the world, C40 cities are taking bold climate actions, leading the way towards a healthier and more sustainable future, while at the same time improving the well-being of their citizens. In Copenhagen, we want to be the first carbon neutral capital city by 2025. It is ambitious, but we are already coming a long way. Carbon emissions are down more than 40%. 40% since 2005, but the goal for this summit is not only to discuss targets. We need to discuss real sustainable solutions to inspire each other to green and inclusive new ways. And of course, also to steal, it's legally to steal from each other when it comes to make good ideas and good, good solutions into your city. And therefore, we are very happy to host this summit because we know that we can learn a lot from each other. And I'm sure if we join force and tackling climate change the right way, we will be able to reduce CO2 emissions, create jobs and make our citizens more livable. Cities are always being central for innovation and we transform our economy to tackle climate, uh, climate crisis. It is an Cities. It is in cities we have the future for happening and also taking the first step also to reduce carbon emissions. Let us make a sustainable transformation. Let us make it inclusive transformation. Let's make it in a fast, fast one. Thank you very much for joining us for this press conference. And now I will pass the floor to my very good colleague and leader of our C14 network and a great leader. Anna Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Good evening and thank you for being here. It is my pleasure to be in front of you today in order to speak about Global Green New Deal in French 
une nouvelle alliance verte. First, I would like uh, to thank you, dear Frank, once again for hosting this summit in Copenhagen, a city that I am sure inspire all participants. This summit represents a landmark in our action in a context of climate emergency. It will give us a great opportunity to move forward on many subjects and show as C40 mayors that solutions do exist and are already implemented to reach the Paris Agreement. Climate emergency is not to demonstrate anymore. The IPCC is clear. We all know the consequences for our planet if we fail to maintain global warming below 1.5 degrees. What we also know is that the most vulnerable today are the ones suffering the most from the climate disaster. Committing to the planet is the social engagement in the sense that ecological and social issues are closely related. Despite what we already know, moving forward on this subject is not easy. I will even say it is a big fight. Because of lobbies and political games, I have been sometimes alone to lead this action in Paris, but backed by the C40 network, by you, dear Eric, Frank, and all my colleagues, mayors here, Fernando, by citizens of Paris, by scientists, by NGOs. That is why the ecological transition must be a collective project and an inclusive one. It should involve and benefit to all citizens. The ecological transition must enable the cities to think in a different way, their organization, their neighborhood, to offer a better quality of life to all citizens. This is how we can define the global Green New Deal, a different way to see the world, to redefine progress, achieving well-being for everyone and protecting our common resources. It supposes for us to change our paradigm. Our public policies related to climate change must be through from a global vision by getting connected to all the other subjects of our municipalities. It should be at the source of job creation, helping minorities, supporting economic development, and making effective changes in personal behavior in the city. This is the ambition of the Green New Deal we are going to discuss in the coming days. It can be seen as a great opportunity to redefine a new economic, social, and ecological pact and gather all the stakeholders from business to association, from civil society to politics, in order to build the future of our cities. My dear friend, Eric Garcetti, and you, and all my colleagues, and Frank, um, has been defending this project in Los Angeles, in Copenhagen, in, in uh, Lisbon, and in other cities. And all the C40's mayors are collectively sharing this objective. That is why it is uh, with joy and emotion that I will leave the C40 chairmanship to Eric Garcetti during this summit to whom I wish all the best by being sure he will succeed in this action. I'm proud and honored of having served this great organization thanks to uh, all my colleagues of the C40 and Mark, especially for you, for uh, the past three years. I know that he feels the same responsibility and that uh, you, Eric, will lead our network and uh, this Green New Deal, this Nouvelle Alliance Verte, with determination and even greater ambition. Thank you very much. Well, 
thank you, Mayor Hidalgo, and you are a partner extraordinary. You are a real friend. You have been an amazing leader and a great dear friend. Um, to Lord Mayor Jensen, I want to thank you for hosting us in this extraordinary city. We know how much work goes into this, and so to all of the Danes who have put their blood, sweat, and tears into organizing this, thank you. And um, I think I can speak for all the mayors that Lord Mayor Jensen really sets the bar globally for what is possible in the shortest time possible, and as such is an inspiration to each one of us. Um, and the work that Anne Hidalgo has done has, as chair has set a global bar for all of us as well. And I know that she certainly will stay active. The best title to have in politics is immediate past chair. It has all the prestige and none of the responsibilities, but she will be really, for so many of us, the inspiration of what bravery, courage looks like. And we, we love you for what you have given to us. Please. And to be here with Mayor Aki Sawyer, to be here with uh, Jamie Margolin, to be here with Steve Cotton and Helen Clarkson, representing this alliance that is more than just mayors, but the cities and the people that live and breathe in them. We know our work is severe and immediate. I am 48 years old, and during my lifetime, 71% of all fossil fuel emissions that have been released by human beings have been released. That's over one trillion tons of CO2. And as a result, as my brother and sister mayor said, we are in a climate emergency. We must be clear. It's an emergency unlike any that we have ever faced before, because what is at stake is nothing less than our survival and the survival of successive generations. This emergency demands that we act and that we come together. In Los Angeles, in my city, the City of Angels, we are working every day to try to embody that, to improve our air quality and build a cleaner, greener, more sustainable city. And it's in this spirit that in our city, we released Los Angeles's Green New Deal, a new deal to push forward a zero carbon electricity grid, to grow a zero emission transportation network, and buildings that will also be zero carbon, while expanding our recycling of wastewater and stop sending trash to landfills. While we did that, we are also looking and very excited to create thousands of good paying middle class jobs. And we're seeing a difference. In the United States of America, Los Angeles is now the number one solar city. And we recently approved the largest solar and battery and electricity generation system in American history at less than the price of gas today. And in a single year, we reduced our emissions by 11% and reduced our unemployment by 14%. And since I've been mayor, we've created 35,000 green jobs in a city of 4 million people. That's nearly 1% of the population. And if Los Angeles is, near, is only 1% of the American population, put that in perspective, those 35,000 jobs are the equivalent of 60% of the remaining coal jobs left across America. So that we have proved that far from being in conflict, that working on ecology and the economy go hand in hand. They are, these two things are inextricably linked. In fact, we can build a more sustainable city at the same time that we protect workers and create new careers. As CEO of my city, I've learned that no matter what you do, no matter what we seek to achieve, we can't do that alone. We aren't just looking at our local problems inside the boundaries of our cities, and that's what makes C40 such an extraordinary network. It's why I'm here in Copenhagen with my fellow mayors from America. You might hear a lot of things about America and climate these days, but we represent, in this room, at least three of the 425 mayors, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, who have accepted the Paris Climate Accords and said, even if the White House is out, we are in. We are practical where others are political. And while others are aspirational, mayors have to be actual. And we don't commute to our jobs, we actually live in the same communities where we work. So while others make promises, we make programs and policies. And now we have, as was mentioned, more than 100 cities committed to C40's deadline 2020 to begin to implement inclusive climate action plans from Austin to Auckland 
cities are taking action and linking growing economic opportunity for everyone and ecological preservation everywhere. We are trying to promote a better life for all of our people. Protecting life is our number one concern. But we're strengthened by the businesses and the workers and the youth across the world who now can come together to support a global Green New Deal. This will be my priority as incoming chair of C40, to deliver a global Green New Deal in the face of a climate emergency and to make the 2020s the decade of human action. This will be the defining decade not only of our lives, but of life itself for human beings on this planet. I have no doubt that we can and we will get it right because human beings have this stubborn desire to survive. And the science is clear. And from C40 cities representing megacities to the mayors of small cities, we're going to engage investors and financiers to help us get the urgent capital we need to move our programs more quickly. We're going to work, sometimes follow youth leaders and sometimes work side by side with them to march in the streets or speak in the classrooms and labor leaders who are seeking to ensure they continue to have a place in our economy. I don't have to tell you what's at stake. The, the stakes have never been greater, but the solutions have never been clearer, easier, and cheaper as well. And every human being, your families, your cities, your communities, deserve a better future that is healthier and cleaner. We must all be prepared to listen to the science, to adhere to the truth, to act on the facts and act with the urgency that this moment demands to deliver a global Green New Deal, to make this the decade of action. And I couldn't be prouder to fight this fight as a member of an incoming chair of this network of mayors of C40. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we are now going to give the floor to Steve Cotton, General Secretary of the International Transport Walkers. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be sitting on such a, an illustrious panel. But the issue is, is such a si serious political situation. And I'm here on behalf of the labor movement globally. And we're here because we want to support the leadership of the mayors. We recognise that this issue can be polarising across the whole of society and in the labour movement, but we believe the work of the C40 mayors is providing global leadership where it's missing in some of our national governments. And we want to be there alongside that conversation about how do we deal with the jobs that will be lost as we respond to the Paris MOU, but how do we make sure that working men and women are not scared or intimidated by the change. So for us, it's a privilege to be here to have a conversation. Obviously, in my capacity as a transport workers leader, cities are critical. Their success economically depends on fast moving transportation. The ability to have a constructive dialogue about the changing face of the workplace. And I would put the future of work alongside this very challenging climate situation. But if we want to be, as Labour leaders, reflective of society, we have to acknowledge the powerful movement on the street. We have to recognise that our voices have to be inclusive of the vulnerable elements of society. We need to protect young people's opportunities to engage effectively. And we need to make sure that gender equality is included in these issues. Because climate change does impact on some of the more challenged elements of our society. And I believe critically that we can find a collective way to respond to those challenges. We can fine tune an agreement, hone it for each element to respond to what we need to do, which is to provide global leadership from the city position. So on behalf of the labor movement, it's our real privilege to be here. They've covered all the facts. Ours is an open engagement about how do we make a difference. Make no mistake, it's difficult in the labour side to respond to the changing face of jobs that may be lost. But if we do it with collaboration and integrity, I'm very confident that we can build a way that ensures our planet for the future generations. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And we are now giving the floor to Jamie Margolin, one of the youth leaders in attendance for the C40 World Mayor Summit. She is the founder of the Zero Hour Movement in the United States of America. Hello, my name is Jamie Margolin. I am not a mayor or a head of state yet. Um, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm a 17 year old. I'm very behind on my college applications and I'm here because my generation's life depends on it. I am here because whether the action that you, our leaders take, is going to impact my generation. I'm here on behalf of the young people in the audience who represent the C40 Youth Council. On the young people, I'm here for the young people on the front lines, those who are putting their lives on the line to stand up for what is right, to stand up for climate justice. I founded an organization called Zero Hour because this is zero hour to act on the climate crisis. We have no more time, and I've been one of the leaders of the youth mobilizing for climate action. Youth are mobilizing because our lives depend on it. The Green New Deal is for us. The Green New Deal is not just about a specific piece of legislation or about a promise that a politician makes. It's about finally ending the fairy tale. Do you believe in fairy tales? Well, right now, the entire government, all of the world's governments, almost, have devoted everything, have sacrificed everything, including the well-being of their children, including life on Earth itself, to sustain a fairy tale. And that fairy tale is eternal economic growth and eternal greed. In the United States, where I come from, it's kind of like a religion, a fanatic religion, where you sacrifice everything, you put everything on the line for something that does not exist. This idea of eternal growth, of taking and taking and taking from the earth with no spending limit and no consideration for any future generations. And with the Green New Deal, it is about not just about making a tweak here and there, not just about maybe changing something here and there. It's about rapidly making a huge system shift. It's about decolonizing, getting to the roots of the climate crisis and the real reason why we're in this mess, which is greed, which is colonialism, which is a lot of what has happened right now with corporations taking advantage of literally everyone else. So with the Green New Deal, with this global Green New Deal, we're calling to an end of sacrificing everything to protect that fairy tale of eternal economic growth and instead putting what really matters first, which is life on earth and the youth and the future generations. We need to rapidly adopt a new way of life and in order to do so, we need to unite behind the global Green New Deal. It's about a global shift of values, ideals, and the way, the way we relate to the earth and one another, shifting from one of extraction and taking to one of sustainability and growth. And while we have to change our ways of living and consuming and traveling, this is not just about sacrifice. I believe the world we can build can really be something better. The future I believe we can create is equitable, sustainable, and has no place for high school seniors such as myself feeling as much fear and despair as I do for my future on a daily basis. I need you to understand the fear and despair that young people live with on a daily basis. We are constantly asked to plan for our future. Right now, I'm in the middle of college application hell, which means tons of questions of what are you going to do when you grow up? What do you want to be? What do you imagine for your future? And I'm sitting there trying to type something, trying to come up with something, but the reality is, if we do not take drastic action on the climate crisis now, nothing I plan is going to mean anything because we'll be too busy dodging climate disasters after climate disasters. That is why, with the mayors and people in power that I'm sitting next to, that's why they're taking action for my future. And we need leaders at all levels of government to get to work. By 2030, we will have known if we have created a political climate that will have allowed us to salvage life on Earth, or if we have acted too late. By then, we must be well down the path towards climate recovery, but this must start today. To, put, to give you an idea of how soon 2030 is, by then I still, I still won't be old enough to run for the American presidency. I still won't be old enough. Um, with the Global Green New Deal, we are surpassing deniers. We are surpassing people who are stopping us from taking action. This isn't about everybody get on board. We're not going to wait 
for deniers to come around. We're not going to wait for governments and corporations to get around. We are going. The cities and people who are willing to take action are going to take action and adopt a Green New Deal now, and everyone else can catch up. People call my generation Generation Z as if we are the last generation. Z is the last letter of the English alphabet, and right now on the current trajectory that we are on, it seems like our generation could be the last one to experience um, modern society as we know it. We certainly are the last generation to be able to at least semi-flourish within the fairy tale that we have been given, this fairy tale of greed and eternal economic growth and just taking from the planet. But after that, that fairy tale will no longer be able to be sustained. So that's why we've decided that we're not Generation Z. We refused to be the last letter of the alphabet. We are Generation GND, the generation of the Green New Deal. And all leaders have two choices. One, join us. Adopt a Green New Deal in your community or your constituency and take action to save your children's futures, or you have a second option, get out. <laughs> Thank you very much. Jamie, and we are now giving the floor to Yvonne Aki Sawyer, Mayor of Freetown, Sierra Leone. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, all. Um, I'm really honored to be here, given that I'm not a C40 mayor, at least not yet. <laughs> um, but yeah. I'm here speaking on behalf of not just my city, but so many other cities and residents and countries who, although they're not major contributors to the causes of climate change, are majorly impacted by the consequences of climate change. Right across the world, our television screens on a daily basis are now reinforcing what the science has said, that extremes of climate are happening, extreme weather conditions are being experienced, nowhere more severely than on the continent of Africa, where from a combination of droughts in the east to extreme floods in the west of the continent, daily the pressure, the impact, the consequences of climate change are resulting in more and more pressure on people's ability to live. Jamie, it's so good to hear um, that you're not going to be Generation Z. And for us, for where we're sitting, and as a mayor of a city with 1.2 million people who daily now face climate change and need to also put in place climate adaptation, we're also not prepared to just sit back. That is why I am so thrilled to have this opportunity to join progressive mayors, such as those in C40, to raise our voices and to say this is an emergency. This isn't something we can talk about later. This isn't something that can be dealt with at some other time. This is something which needs to be dealt with now. On the 14th of August, two years ago, 2017, in the space of about 12 hours, we had 81.3 millimeters of rain. It resulted in a landslide in which 1,000 people died in five minutes. I became mayor just over a year after that, just under a year after that, in May 2018. I became the mayor. I contested on a platform which was not about politics per se because I didn't come from a political space. I came from a space of being deeply concerned about the environment in which we're living and the damage that's being done to it on a daily basis. So within my one year and five months of being mayor, the mayor of Austin just called me a baby mayor. I like that. <laughs> Within my one year and five months of being mayor, we've introduced in the city of Freetown 
an ambitious program which has as its heart, at its heart, our response to the challenges of climate change and the need for climate adaptation. It's called hashtag transform Freetown. Um, and we are making tremendous progress simply because we have chosen to do this, looking at the data, bringing innovation, and most importantly, bringing in collaboration, having partnerships with the public sector, with the private sector, and of course, with the people. And in our Transform Freetown agenda, to date, we have been able to tackle the most serious contributions that we make, small as they might be on the global scale, we also have our own contribution to greenhouse gases. Those two being poor sanitation and poor transport, fossil fuel transport. With sanitation, we've set ourselves a target of moving from a situation where in my city, only 6% of liquid waste and 21% of solid waste was being collected. And what was collected was going into dump sites, which two dump sites, 30 and 40 years old respectively, literally belching methane. That was our contribution. We have brought into place an expansive program which goes end to end from behavior change involving communities participating in the cleanest zone competition through to improvements on collection and most significantly from the perspective of climate change, making sure that all our residents have access to waste collection services by bringing, putting in place an app called findmeinfreetown.com which links users to service providers. And now we are converting one of those dump sites into an engineered landfill and closing down the other and reopening a new space, which will be a waste park as well as wastewater treatment and a landfill. And this is all about scale and relative. I heard Mary Gassetti say they're moving away from landfills. It'd be good to have a landfill. It'd be good to have a landfill which is designed to be sustainable and builds in recycling and which is a hundred million light years away from just an open dump site. And in the area of transport, we have very significant challenges, shall I say, with the road network. So rather than try to deal with that and introduce what would be in many places and obvious when it comes to mass transit, um, a bus rapid transit system, we're actually going up and we're bringing cable cars, which will move 6,000 people in an hour, removing from the streets the collection of old taxis and tuk-tuks and what we call poda podas, they're the little minivans, none of which are probably younger than about 20 years old. Um, and as you see them going along and you see the black smoke coming out, you know that our air pollution problem is just getting worse. So we're dealing with very challenging situations, but that's in terms of our contribution to reducing greenhouse gases. But as I mentioned, we're on the brunt. We're experiencing the consequences of the climate change which is happening because of what's going on in the rest of the world. And even though so many of these mayors and so many of you are doing such a great job in terms of trying to reduce the rate of the greenhouse emissions and ultimately to getting to zero carbon. For the immediate future, we still need to adapt because that climate change impact is still being felt. Just eight weeks ago, on the 2nd of August, we had another extreme occurrence where in the space of three hours, we had 176 millimeters of rainfall. I was in the city. Um, we actually had um, the Swiss Development Corporation as guests. And as we drove along, we just saw everything floating. That day, we saw firsthand why the work that we're doing is so important. We didn't lose a 1,000 lives. 
on the 2nd of August this year. We lost five, and those five still matter. But we also saw that the work that we've started to do with flood mitigation since I came into office made a tremendous difference. So the waters came, but the waters receded in a shorter space of time. That is why we're investing in stormwater drainage around the city. That is why we're replanting trees. And this last rainy season, we took baby steps. In the space of six weeks, we planted 23,000 trees. And we're committed next year to planting a million trees in Freetown. It's hashtag transform Freetown, Freetown Treetown. And also as important is moving vulnerable communities out of hazard prone areas. The coastal erosion that we're seeing, the rising sea levels, all put people, people's lives at risk. None of this, none of what we've achieved would have been possible without partnerships. And as the global Green New Deal is being put on the table and promoted by C40 cities, I'd like to say that in Freetown and in many other cities around the world, and particularly on our continent, we see the need for this because we need to divert resources away from the things that are destroying our planet towards those things, job creation, infrastructure, adaptive technologies that will ena enable those most affected and most vulnerable, who's not just their long-term futures, but actually their today and their absolute tomorrow is now at risk because of climate change. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm looking forward to building these partnerships in the coming days and months. I do believe this is an emergency. I know that most people in this room believe it too. I also believe that we can do something to save the situation and to save our planet. The future we want is in our hands. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are now giving the floor to Helen Clarkson, the CEO of the Climate Group. Thank you. Thanks very much for inviting us. The Climate Group really welcomes this initiative from the C40 mayors. It's exactly the sort of approach that we need to see to deliver a world where we limit warming to 1.5 degrees C with greater prosperity for all. Um, at the Climate Group, we work with over 300 multinational businesses. They make commitments around renewable electricity, uh, electric vehicles, doubling energy productivity. So the RE100, EV100, EP100 campaigns. And through that work, what we see is that when you set these ambitious targets, it unleashes innovation and starts to lead people to hit their targets sooner and believe that they can do more. And so it's a real accelerant for action. We also work with um, 200 states and regions through the Under Two Coalition, which was set up in the run-up to Paris with this fear that the, there wouldn't be an agreement and that they needed to take action. So through these sorts of approaches, we've seen how driven businesses, states and regions and cities are and how this can really support when intergovernmental processes aren't delivering the level of ambition that we like and that we need. And so we all need to press forward together with this work, both to continue to deliver action, but also to show national governments that there is leadership in the real economy and support them to do more and go further. Um, we've heard a lot today about the IPCC report that came out last year. It made such a clear case that we have to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C. We have to put every effort that we can in towards that goal. And in order to do that, we've got to halve emissions in the next decade. And most of the work needs to be done in the next few years because we know these sorts of cuts take a while to take effect. Um, it's why at the climate group, we're referring to the 2020s as the climate decade, because we believe that it has to be the primary goal of the world in the next 10 years to get emissions down while ensuring prosperity and managing a just transition. This means a profound shift in the way that we live, the way we do business, and the shape of our cities. And it's a change, it's a profound change. The world hasn't seen this scale before. The nearest we've seen is the rebuilding that came after World War II, but that was in response to something that had happened. This is about working towards a common goal. Um, 
When President Roosevelt launched the original New Deal at the end of the Depression, it triggered businesses to unleash innovation and to pull the US out of that depression. It's exactly the same sort of approach we need to see now. We need to trigger innovation and market shifts in order to meet this challenge of the climate decade. We know and we've seen that businesses are finding opportunities in this low carbon transition, but we need to do much more. We need to go much farther. And we really support and welcome the ambition and foresight of C40 mayors in launching this today. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are running a little bit out of time, so we will take very quickly two quick Zen questions. What type of future tech do you think is the best for creating the future we want? Would it be zero footprint houses, electric buses, flying cars, artificial intelligence? Can you mention some specifics that you would like to try out? Thank you for that question. Uh, in Copenhagen, we know what it's, what's works and what doesn't when it comes to transform your city to be green and reduce carbon emissions because we have already cut down emissions with 40% since 2005. And that's because of our very efficient district heating system. 99% of all households in Copenhagen are linked to district heating. Now we also in introduce a district cooling where we can take the cold water from the harbor and distribute the coal in, in the pipes beside the district heating pipe. So we can reduce uh, electricity for cooling down buildings and server rooms in the factories with 70%. We have bicycle lanes, 435 kilometers of bicycle lanes. We have a portfolio of many, many solutions, and we share them with our colleagues in other cities. So we, we know what's work. We have the technology. We have the solutions. We just have to act for the young people also. I'd also like to add, it's not one specific technology that is going to save us. It's a huge combination of them, but it's also about accessibility. Uh, a lot of what the Green New Deal is about is about accessibility and addressing that the climate crisis impacts the most vulnerable communities the most. Um, so anyone who is uh, at the receiving end of a system of oppression, whether that be racism, sexism, um, any sort of colonialism, uh, etc., all of the isms, is going to be feel the worst effects of the climate crisis. And and this isn't an accident. The climate crisis, the way it played out is not an accident. The way corporations will specifically target communities of color and low-income communities is not an accident. So this um, mass death and sickness of our planet and our people is happening exactly the way those who created it wanted it to happen and hurting those who wanted it to happen. So when it comes to these technologies and what the Global Green New Deal, what, what it encompasses, is also about making these technologies accessible to people and especially um, especially catering them towards different communities. There is no one all overlaying solution or technology that is going to work for every community. It's about which technologies work for which communities and how do we make sure that everyone has access to them, including the most vulnerable. Um, hi, um, here at Gov City, you say that uh, Mayo don't make promises, they make program. Uh, Frank Jensen, here in Copenhagen, you have cut uh, emission uh, very hardly by 42% in 10 years, and you have the objective to be natural in two, um, 2025, right? Um, a question for you, Anne Hidalgo. Uh, do you share the same objective? Is it possible to be natural in Paris in uh, 2025, maybe? Same question for Eric Garcetti and for the Maya of Rita. Yes, of course. Uh, for me, uh, Copenhagen is an example because um, Copenhagen starts, uh, for example, in uh, the mobility with uh, uh, the target uh, about uh, bicycle in um, 1919. Uh, we start a few years ago in, uh, in Paris, but today this example it's very interesting for us because the work uh, of Copenhagen is uh, very useful for me and we can uh, accelerate our solutions. When you have um, many uh, examples in another cities and you can share the solution, you can accelerate. 
And for me, yes, it's possible. You know, when we work in uh, in Paris, in France, uh, about uh, air pollution, when we work about uh, energy, about waste, about uh, circular economy, we uh, bring all the example of uh, another city in all continents. You know, and we can accelerate because the solutions are here. You need to. Uh, um, make the translation because uh, uh, our context, the context of our cities are very different. But if you say that it's uh, very efficient in this city, you know that you can do the same in your city and accelerate the story. And maybe in your um, uh, previous um, question, I think it's not just about technology. We, we need technology and the new technologies, the green technology help us. But we need commitment. We need commitment with citizens. It's very, very important. And we need commitment with journalists. And we need commitment with uh, entrepreneurs, we need commitment. That is this uh, uh, new uh, green uh, New Deal, uh, this in French, this uh, Nouvelle Alliance Verte. I'd also like to challenge the idea of the question of whether something is possible, um, because coming from my generation as a young person inheriting this problem but not actually having any of the political power or physical ability to be in these, these positions of power to actually reverse it. I've had lots of conversations with politicians where young people will be challenging um, politicians and saying, please, can you do this for our lives, for our futures? We literally don't have time. And their response is, well, it isn't possible by this deadline. It isn't possible. And it's like a slap in the face because it's not a matter of whether you you think something is possible. We don't get to decide these things. There's the scientific limit of what the carbon levels that we have to get down to by a certain time in order to survive. And that survival is of my generation. And a leader cannot look their kid in the eye and say, well, I don't know, it's just not possible. We have to be willing to do what we previously considered impossible. We have to be willing to set these impossible standards for ourselves in order to solve this issue and because what's politically possible, I mean technically we haven't even invented the politics um, that will be able to transition um, our society into this entire new world. People would, with this massive climate crisis, a lot of the solutions and a lot of the shifts that have to happen are going to be perceived as impossible. And only looking back on it will we say, like, wow, we did that. But what has to happen is literally our leaders need to do absolutely anything they can in order to be able to look their children in the eye and say, I did absolutely everything I could for you. I'd say absolutely anything is possible, and it has to be. I'd say also for the leaders sitting next to me, um, a lot of people are wondering, you know, how do you know if it's enough, the, the action that you're taking is enough? How do you know what's the measurement? And I have an easy um, test or way of measuring if you know what you are doing about the climate crisis is enough. If you can look your child in the eye and say, honey, I did literally absolutely everything I could for you. There is no stone I left unturned. There is absolutely, I've exhausted every option, every last brain cell, every last part of my being in order to solve this crisis, then you're doing enough. If, if you can't say that, if you can't look them in the eye and say there is nothing I haven't tried, then it's not enough. So survival has to be possible and the solutions for that have to be possible or made possible if they seem impossible. Thank you very much. We are going to give the last words to the new C40 chair, Mayor Eric Garcetti, before having a picture for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you. I, I received my time to free time. No, but I'm going to give it back to him. <laughs> it was just so that we could answer your question from all okay. of the cities. And for us, I would say that um, carbon neutral by 2025 is simply not going to be possible. Um, but we're committing to 2030. And that's because we're starting from a very low base, um, but the, we're, we're on the trajectory and we, by God's grace, we'll get there. Yes, yeah, so I'll answer the question, I guess conclude. Um, Copenhagen will be the bar, I meant that. So the, the simple answer is 
No, by 2025. But to build on what Jamie was saying, here's my advice to every political leader around the world, is to every year make the most aggressive estimate that you can for carbon neutrality, with the caveat to look that child or that activist or that business leader or that labor leader or resident in the eye and say, and next year, I will look at that and see if I can reduce that further. Because things are changing so quickly. What I said was unimaginable. What is possible? It wasn't possible to get solar power for less than gas just a couple of years ago, maybe even last year. Um, and now it is in California. Um, it wasn't possible to think about an entire fleet of buses being electric. And now in Shenzhen, China, they are 100% electric. So what we think is possible changes so quickly. We need to make a commitment not just to a date, but we have to make commitments to bringing that date as close to us as we can every moment we see a new technology, a new will, a new um, uh, incarnation. And to anybody who thinks this is going to be expensive, of course, of course it is. But it's much more expensive to wait. It's much more expensive to not make these investments. In the United States of America, we've spent in the last two years in our country as much as we spent in the previous 27 years just for the effects of climate extremism. Um, students in Houston couldn't even go out to protest for the climate strike because of the sixth once-in-a-lifetime rain event. These are happening so quickly. So, uh, no, we, we won't get there by 2025. But we're going to, unless next year I can come to you and say, yes, we will. But right now, looking you in the eye, I can't. Um, just to conclude, I want to thank again Mary Jensen for hosting us in this extraordinary setting. I hope for all of us who have not, yes, round of applause. I thank Mayors Adler and Caldwell as well, my American colleagues who are here, and all the mayors who have joined us. And again, praise, and we'll be saying this all week long, but uh, uh, Mary Hidalgo's courage and leadership. Um, for all of us right now, we know that this is indeed zero hour. We know this is the moment to act, and we know this will be the decade to make or break this earth. Um, but I, I know a lot of times we talk about these things and we leave feeling like it's stormy weather out there. I leave with tremendous optimism because if there is one organization that is doing the work of the climate change implementation, that is somewhere between the empty promises and the activism in the streets, that is C40. And we will enact a global Green New Deal in the cities of the world that represent 25% of the GDP. For those cities that aren't yet uh, members and uh, who look to us, we hope that 100% of the cities of the world will be able to follow that lead and teach us what their lessons are as well. And together, we'll make sure this was the decade in which this Earth and this planet, as well as our economy, was saved. Thank you all so much for being here. So we are now going to organize a photo and we are inviting all the city officials to join on stage. So mayors, just let us